I'm going to get us started then. So I recognize two and a half hours is an awfully long time. Uh, and definitely the plan of action is that we should take a 15 minute break in between uh, because otherwise, you know, we're all going to die and that wouldn't be pleasant. Um, OK, so what are we doing here? This is, um, I see this talk mostly as an introduction to behavioral economics. Uh, I'm not really going to do a, a survey of research frontiers. At some point, we're going to get to research frontiers. But my assumption very much is that, uh, you know, we're going to try to cover the basic stuff uh, and go deep on the basics rather than talk about sort of very, very new theories for the most part. Uh, I'm going to assume uh, from the fact that you're at EC that you know uh, quite a lot about game theory and mechanism design. I'm not going to assume you know economic theory more generally, uh, behavioral economics, or psychology. Uh, you know, please, please ask questions, especially if you're skeptical. Uh, a lot of the stuff here has the status of, like, I think, promising theory with some bugs. And I think it helps a lot to sort of tease out those bugs more interactively. So if you're skeptical about some assertion, if you think there's a problem with some evidence, you know, please push in those things. It will help a lot to reach clarity. Um, now, I've made one major omission uh, in the things I'm going to try to cover today, which is I've decided uh, not to try to cover time inconsistent preferences, even though these are undoubtedly a major and important part of behavioral economics. Uh, I'm doing this for two reasons. Uh, one is that a lot of AGT work doesn't involve time discounting at all. So I think it's relatively less useful for me to spend time on variations of the classical discounting model if you're not using a discounting model in the first place. Uh, the other reason is just I have some preference to spend time talking about things where I have intelligent things to say. And I'm not sure I have intelligent things to say about time discounting uh, over and above the things you could already get by reading that literature. OK, so the thought goes that, especially if you're a grad student in the room, uh, what might you do with uh, the stuff we're going to do today? One thought is that you might try to take standard uh, behavioral theories of human behavior and integrate these into your own work where appropriate. Another thought is that you might tr to try to write new behavioral theories. Uh, now, uh, a, a, a word of caution, it's very, very easy to write bad behavioral theory. Uh, and you spend quite a long time writing bad theory before you learn to write good theory. Um, and I think it's quite useful when starting out with that to read uh, two things. One is uh, Matthew Rabin has this uh, beautiful article essentially expositing how he goes about thinking about writing behavioral theories. That's, I found that very useful to read. Uh, and the other uh, is just having some thought about what we're trying to do with a scientific theory more generally. Uh, I found this essay by Karl Popper uh, to be good reading for that, um, to tr just try to make clear what we're doing when we're writing down a new theory. Um, beyond that, one thing I was surprised at, uh, because we're about to get into risk aversion and expected utility, uh, I hadn't known uh, the degree to which these things were intertwined even very early on in the history of the ACM. Uh, but certainly, one prevalent view of behavioral economics is to say that standard rational agent models are far too mathematical. Uh, we should both psychologize these models and make them less mathematical. Uh, I'm not sure we should make them less mathematical, but we certainly should try to psychologize them. And if anything, uh, I think you'll see from the stuff we're talking about today that there's a great value in formal mathematical theorizing because it forces us to be precise about the behavioral assumptions we're making. So much of today is going to be in the spirit of being reasonably psychological about modeling human behavior, uh, but not at all trying to demathematize it. All right, so sort of zooming back out, right? Um, wait, just quick survey of the room. Um, how many of you would say that your background is primarily CS? OK, how many of you would say your background is primarily economics? OK, so this is not going to be completely, completely uh, wasted, some of these slides. All right. Now, one of the things that sort of puzzled me when I first started coming to EC was this disjoint between uh, the way economists tend to write down some sort of 
prior about the world and do you know, some sort of expected utility analysis and uh, the interest in computer science and worst case analysis. And it took me a while to understand exactly why uh, we're going at this from different directions. And I think this comes down to an argument uh, that pretty much got won by von Neumann uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, which is that the standard theory of expected utility maximization tells us that uh, if I have objective risks, that's to say, if I'm say, you know, if I give you a lottery over different outcomes where you know the numerical probabilities of the, the, of the different outcomes, uh, some fairly simple axioms imply that decision makers should act as though they are maximizing expected utility. That's to say, there is some utility function over outcomes such that the decision maker should act as if they are maximizing that function. Um, and these, you know, if you haven't seen them before, are worth a look. Uh, they are exceedingly simple, normatively appealing axioms. They essentially say, uh, first, that if I give you any two lotteries over outcomes, you can rank them. Uh, second, that if you prefer A to B and B to C, you should prefer A to C. Continuity, that's to say, if you give me uh, a great lottery and a bad lottery, I can find some, and if you give me any medium lottery, some mixture over the great lottery and the bad lottery makes you indifferent with the medium lottery. And independence, which essentially says that if two lotteries are exactly the same for some, so if, I, if you prefer lottery A to B, and I mix in some probability P of a third lottery C into both lotteries A and B, uh, your preferences don't change. So these seem normatively very appealing. Uh, you know, when you see the axioms, it's hard to believe that any human being wouldn't satisfy them. Uh, it turns out those are equivalent to maximizing expected utility. Moreover, uh, the argument goes further. Uh, imagine that there weren't objective numerical probabilities attached to each outcome. Well, Savage has uh, a further version of this theory that essentially says that for those kinds of subjective risks, a further set of simple axioms imply that decision makers should act as though they are maximizing expected utility for some probability distribution. So this argument essentially says, look, if you're rational, you should act as though you're maximizing expected utility. What if you don't have a prior? Well, you should be acting as though you have a prior. And so these arguments essentially persuaded economists for a long time, I think this is changing lately, but persuaded economists for a very long time that this was not only the right way, the normatively right way to write down models, but this was the right way to think about human behavior. Okay, so this, let me give you a pair of anomalies that might chip away at why, you know, at, at the belief that this is a good way to model human behavior. Uh, the first anomaly is the endowment effect. So this is a, a really classic lab experiment uh, that, got run at the, that got run at Cornell. Um, so the thought is you, in a, you, you take a classroom full of students and you randomly allocate half of them coffee mugs or ballpoint pens. Uh, doesn't hugely matter. And what you do is you offer a market clearing mechanism for trade. And in particular, the mechanism works a little bit like this. Uh, you, at each line, you state for each price whether or not you're willing to sell. If, you don't, if you're not allocated a coffee mug for each line, you state whether or not you're willing to buy. Uh, there are quite a lot of students, 44, so you approximately can't affect the market clearing price. It's approximately truthful to uh, state your true values on each line. It's, it's a much longer list than this, of course. We randomly, uh, you know, we find the market clearing price and we execute trades at that price. So, this is the data from those experiments. There are 44 subjects in total. And what you can see is, essentially, if I don't know who values mugs the most, uh, and I randomly allocate uh, 22 mugs to 44 students, in expectation, I should have 11 trades, right? Because uh, you know, when you state your prices, we should get to whoever values it the most, and I'm allocating randomly. And what you can see um, first is that you get substantially fewer trades than uh, classical theory would predict. In particular, uh, you only get about sort of, you know, one to five trades for the mugs and the pens. And not only that, there's a systematic gap between uh, the buyer's stated willingness to pay and the seller's stated 
willingness to sell. Now, these two medians shouldn't be different, right? Like if classical theory says, well, you have some value for a mug, ruling out for the moment income effects, and hopefully the mug isn't so valuable it's going to have a substantial income effect, uh, these two things should be the same because they've allocated randomly the mugs to buyers and sellers. There's no reason why the value that buyers have for mugs is systematically lower than the value that sellers have for mugs. Uh, now, of course, this mechanism is only approximately truthful. Uh, you know, that you could potentially sometimes make small misrepresentations that help you, uh, but the effect persists even if you use an exactly truthful mechanism. So you can replicate this using a randomly drawn price rather than a market clearing mechanism, and it turns out that that just as well uh, gives you the same result. Now, one very natural thought is, hold on, this is just that people don't understand the mechanism. Um, and so a very natural, or, or maybe people have transaction costs. They don't like the act of handing over something to someone else. This is a hassle. They don't want to do it. So what you might do instead is you might run a, an induced value market. So you give people a physical voucher that's worth a certain amount of money, and you elicit willingness to pay and willingness to accept for that voucher. Uh, and what you can see uh, is that if you do this, you get results are pretty much bang on. You should have 11 trades. We get basically 11 trades in all the trials. Uh, and I think you can guess what the value for the voucher was in each trial. So this doesn't seem to be a story about transaction costs or misunderstanding the mechanism. So that's one view, right? This, this is a weird anomaly that doesn't seem consistent with the idea that everybody's maximizing some value function that depends on you know, whether or not they have a mug and how much money is in their pocket. But here, I think, is another anomaly which is, in my view, more troubling for the theory, which is that uh, very robustly, human beings tend to exhibit risk aversion over what we might think of as small stakes. And this is weird because uh, you know, in the standard formulation of expected utility theory, the only reason why you can have risk aversion is that your utility function for wealth is concave. But you know, um, in that case, a first order Taylor expansion establishes that if you have a fairly small gamble, you should be approximately risk neutral. And the natural question then is, all right, all right, but how small is small, right? If I've got a reasonable sort of concave utility function over my lifetime wealth, like what does that in fact imply? Are, are, are we talking hundreds of dollars? Are we talking cents? Uh, OK, so here's a pop quiz, because I assume everybody here is, 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 is great at doing this kind of algebra in their heads. Uh, Johnny is a risk-averse expected utility maximizer. Uh, that's to say that he always turns down gambles that are heads, $11, tails, you lose 10. Uh, now, the thought is we're going to offer Johnny a gamble of heads plus y, tails minus $100. And we're just going to think, for which values of y do we know, based on just this information, that Johnny will turn down the gamble? All right, so um, you know, we've, got a, we've got 101, 110, 1,000, 10,000. Johnny will reject no matter what y is. And this isn't a well-formed question. We can't say without more information. And you know, um, just to get a sense of the room, uh, who here thinks the answer is that uh, Johnny will that the highest value of y that we know Johnny will turn it down at is 101? Who here thinks it's a? B? C? D? E? F? OK, well, it turns out the answer is E. Uh, Johnny will reject for all values of y up to and including the GDP of the Earth. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, this local curvature in the utility function lets you make an algebraic argument that bounds the global curvature of the utility function. And in fact, just this degree of local curvature that suffices to make him always turn down the heads plus 11, tails minus 10, suffices to ensure that there is literally no value of y such that Johnny will take the 50-50 gamble, heads plus y, tails minus 100. Um, now, this is one of these cases where I don't think we need to run the experiment to know which way this turns out. There are quite a lot of human beings on this Earth who say, 
yes to the first, who say no to the first gamble and who say yes to the second. Um, sorry, this is true as a mathematical, as a mathematical fact. If Johnny is a risk-averse expected utility maximizer, that's to say he has some strictly increasing weakly concave function for wealth with the property that for all wealth values, he turns down that gamble. That's to say the expected utility of gaining 11 with 50% with 50 probability and losing 10 with 50% probability is less than the expected utility of remaining at his current wealth level. It turns out that for any utility function satisfying that property, then he's going to turn down that other gamble. The expected utility of heads plus y, tails minus 100 is less than the expected utility of turning it down. And so just to give you a sense, uh, yeah? Uh, no, so, so the only conditions we require are that the utility function is strictly increasing in wealth and weakly concave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're going to give, we're, we're going to offer bigger gambles at bigger wealth levels. Yeah, I think, so certainly the theorem wouldn't apply to that. Um, and what you're doing there is you're essentially saying when someone gets rich enough, they're going to start uh, being less risk averse in a, in a certain way. Um, okay, so. Can I delay that question a little bit till I give you, uh, till I give you the, more of the result? Because it will make a bit, a bit of sense there. Uh, so this is uh, Rabin's calibration theorem, which uh, is at once incredibly insightful and uh, a really ugly piece of algebra. So I'm not going to put the algebra up. Uh, it turns out that in general, turning down small stakes gambles uh, has, has certain implications for how you behave about large stakes gambles. Uh, and so this just gives you the list. Apologies for the tiny font, uh, but this shows you for each uh, small stakes gamble here, you know, gain 11, lose 10, uh, which gain infinity, lose, lose y gamble, we can be sure that the, that the agent turns down. So I guess the thing, the thing to take away from this, if you sort of find your favorite small stakes gamble that you think is reasonable that most human beings would turn down is that uh, what we would probably observe as small stakes risk aversion has bizarre implications at large stakes. And so if you think that there is one utility function that governs the small stakes gambles and the large stakes gambles, uh, it doesn't seem like that can be true. Now, I would say, right, like, and I, you know, I think a, a critique that I think Jason is maybe thinking of is that maybe people get less risk averse at much higher stakes. Um, and it turns out that you can give, I've, I've stated this because this version is clean, but you can give sort of more circumspect versions of the theorem that say, if you're going to reject this gamble at all levels of wealth between, you know, some lower bound and some upper bound, then we can have, uh, you know, then we can, in fact, say you're also going to reject the following large gamble. Um, and so these things are not completely reliant on the idea that you would do this at stratospheric levels of wealth. Uh, we probably wouldn't be able to say gain infinity, but we would be able to say gain some ridiculous amount of money, like a billion dollars. So you know, it could well be that if I know that you're going to reject, you know, say, uh, lose 100, gain 110, at all levels between your current wealth level and a billion dollars, I can make the similar statement about lose a thousand, gain a billion dollars. Um, yeah? So I'm not sure what model you have of effort cost, but I guess we could then scale up further down the chart to the ones where we're potentially gaining $100 from doing the coin flip. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we could imagine running experiments where uh, it took just as much effort to say yes to the coin flip as to say no. For instance, I could say no matter what you do, 
you're going to sit here, we're going to flip the coin. You just need to tick a box that says whether you'd prefer to have the coin flip or not. Um, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Right, right. So, so again, right, like this version of it that has it going all the way up to infinity is, uh, is the cleaner version to state. But we could equally state a version that says, um, if, you know, let's replace infinity with some amount x. If you're indifferent, if, if you're willing to turn on the gamble at all levels of wealth between your current wealth and x, then you would also uh, turn down the big gamble. So it's not completely dependent on this extending up to infinity. Sure, um, maybe, you know, maybe you would be different if you were a billionaire, but we could equally be talking about sort of lose 10,000, gain 20,000, which seems like a gamble that many people should take. Or lose 10,000, gain 50,000. Do we think that people's willingness to accept these gambles would really change dramatically if they had another 50,000 in their pocket? Maybe it would, but... Okay, I mean, look, there, one thing I take away from this is that the right-hand side gambles seem to me obviously things I would want to take. And therefore, since I think of the von neumann morgensen axioms as normatively appealing, I should be adjusting my behavior on all the left-hand side gambles. Um, but I guess one thought here, right, is insofar as it's hard within a theory of... Uh, of just having an expected utility over wealth to make sense simultaneously of small stakes and large stakes risk behavior. Uh, one attempt to harmonize these is prospect theory. Now, prospect theory uh, is you know, a classic psychological theory of decision making under risk. It makes three essential departures from expected utility. Uh, now, I'm not going to cover all three of these departures in detail. Uh, but there's probability weighting, which roughly says that you will, uh, you will overestimate small probabilities and you will underestimate large probabilities. So if a probability is close to zero, you'll treat it as bigger. And if a probability is close to one, you'll treat it as smaller. There's uh, something called diminishing sensitivity and there's loss aversion, which is the thing I want to focus in on. So loss aversion essentially says that the decision maker, rather than having some absolute utility over outcomes, uh, evaluates gains and losses relative to some reference point, where losses are going to weigh more heavily than gains. Uh, and you know, in my limited opinion, I think this is potentially the most robust, empirically robust, and tractable part of the theory. It's certainly the part of the theory that has gotten most easily integrated into economic models. Um, so let me be a little bit more precise. We can think of an alternative as a one-dimensional random variable C for consumption. Uh, and we're given some increasing utility function M. Uh, and faced with some choice at C, an expected utility maximizer is going to pick the gamble to maximize the expected utility. Here's the, I think, easiest way to integrate loss aversion into that model. Uh, give me some reference point R. We could think of this as the status quo and give me two parameters, some eta, which is non-negative, and some lambda, which is greater than one. And we could define a sort of gain-loss utility function. This is going to reward the decision maker for gains above the reference point and penalize losses. But we're going to penalize losses proportionately more than we reward gains. So given some reference point r, we're going to have it be that this psychological utility is equal to eta times the difference between utility at the consumption level and utility at the reference point when this is positive, and eta lambda times this otherwise. So from the fact that lambda is greater than 1, we're going to penalize a loss at least as much as a gain. And so we're going to say that facing some choice set, the decision maker picks 
the gamble, which maximizes the sum of m and this psychological utility. Now, obviously, this contains classical expected utility as a special case. That's just eta is equal to 0. Um, and a useful thing here is to think of m as being a kind of material utility, right? It's the direct classical part of the function we're maximizing, and n is the gain-loss part. OK, so this may be a new formalism. Uh, questions have probably been unclear on some important part. Cool. Yes? Oh, yes, yes. So, so this, is, this is a very particular choice. And in particular, we don't have a beautiful axiomatization like von neumann morgenstern for making this particular choice. Uh, indeed, it's odd that we're even just multiplying by eta and lambda rather than doing something else. Um, I guess one thought here uh, is that this turns out to be a really good compromise between uh, sort of capturing the phenomenon and being tractable. Having it be additively separable, having it just scale linearly like this, turns out to mean that you can take this model and plug it easily into a lot of economic situations that you were using standard expected utility maximization for and easily solve it out by hand. And it turns out that in terms of adoption, that's a big virtue. Um, but you could well imagine more general formalisms of this. Uh, and if you look at uh, Kosegi Rabin 2006, they'll offer a more general class for which this is just the sort of leading special case that people use when they want to make a point. Um, all right, so one view of this is that this provides a way to explain uh, small stakes risk aversion without creating weird large stakes behavior. So the calibration theorem says this thing, right? That if Johnny turns down heads getting his wealth level plus 11, tails his wealth level minus 10 at all wealth levels w, then he turns down this big gamble at all wealth levels w. And that's just a statement about strictly increasing weakly concave functions m, uh, which you can see up on the slide. Now, the thought is that Suppose I set a reference point equal to the status quo wealth. So I say, whatever wealth level you have, that's your reference point, And you're going to evaluate gains and losses with respect to your wealth level. Then I could even let material utility be completely linear. Uh, and then I can have, you know, pick a bunch of parameters out of the hat. I can say eta is 1, lambda is 1 and a half. And if you're using this loss aversion model, what you get with a little bit of algebra is that the decision maker is going to accept these coin flips if and only if the ratio of gain to loss is greater than 1.25. Now, I'm not asserting this is like the right utility function for everybody, but this is a clean way of seeing that loss aversion lets us generate what looks like small stakes risk aversion without necessarily implying weird large stakes behavior. It lets us, in some sense, partially decouple small stakes and large stakes risk behavior because by using this lambda and penalizing losses more than gains, I can make it so that you're willing to say no to small gambles. But because this kink is being placed at exactly where your wealth level is at each point, that doesn't imply anything about the curvature of the material utility function m. So nothing about this argument, you know, there, there's no algebraic argument for a loss averse utility maximizer, well, for, for, for a loss averse agent that lets us place bounds on M based solely on his decisions about these kinds of small stakes gambles. So one view of loss aversion is that it provides a way to harmonize behavior at different scales of, of money. Questions? Um, so, I, I bet that if you're taking eta and lambda roughly in this range, you're going to do pretty well on small stakes risk aversion in experiments. 
like, OK, so I haven't completely arbitrarily picked these. Uh, I think uh, from my conversations with Matthew, my impression is these are his favorite values. Uh, and from that, I gather that they must do well when you actually fit them to data. Yeah. I think there are some attempts in decision theory to axiomatize these. Um, but I'm not sure if we have anything that's as sort of transparent and clean as von Neumann Morgenstern yet. Yeah? Sorry, Kelly, you look like you might have a question. Yeah? Cool? I was just wondering, like, so what is the threshold for a small statement to be considered a large statement? Like, how does it kind of like Oh, so you're not, defining it, you're not defining it explicitly at all, right? You're just saying, look, I'm going to pick these, you know, this function m, these eta, these lambda, and we're going to let the model do what it does. Um, but it so happens that uh, this model has the result that no matter how small I go, right? Like if I, I, I could be offering you gambles in a fraction of a cent, and this, the fact that I've got a kink at your current wealth level implies risk aversion at those wealth levels. But it's not like there's a sharp threshold within the model itself between small and large stakes. It just you know, lets you accommodate some amount of small stakes risk aversion without necessarily implying lots of large stakes risk aversion. OK, so a very natural extension, and this is not the order of discovery. This is just an order of exposition, is to think of this a version of this model that let, let, lets us have multiple dimensions of consumption. So you can think about sort of losing a mug and gaining money, or gaining a mug and losing money, and treating these potentially differently rather than just adding them up. Um, and so the thought is, suppose we have some k dimensions of consumption, and we have a separate reference point for each dimension. Um, we could imagine saying that the decision maker just maximizes this additively separable function, right? For each dimension, we're going to take the material utility of that dimension of consumption plus this gain-loss utility, where we're going to specify the gain-loss utility exactly as before. Now, notice I've made a a restriction uh, just to try to keep the model low dimensional. I've said the eta and the lambda are the same across all dimensions. That doesn't necessarily need to be true, but it seems to be useful to tie our hands, not to overfit data, to try to do something like that. Uh, and it turns out that if you think about that version of the model, where each dimension is additively separable, then uh, this provides one explanation for the endowment effect. In particular, if you think that you've got the mug dimension, your value for the mug is v, right? Uh, you've got your money dimension, which is linear. I'm going to normalize your money holdings to 0. We're going to say that if you already are allocated a mug, if you own a mug, your reference point is owning a mug. If you uh, don't own a mug, your reference point is not owning a mug. And your uh, reference point for money is whatever you started with. Well, then what you can do, you just chunk through the model. If you own a mug and you choose to keep a mug, your value for doing that is v. That's your material plus your gain-loss utility. If you sell the mug at p, then what happens is you gain p, uh, and then this is your gain-loss utility. You've got eta times the gain of p minus lambda eta times the loss of v. And similarly, if you don't own a mug and you choose to buy a mug at p, what you get is v minus p. That's the material utility. Eta v, you've gained a mug minus lambda eta of p, you've lost p dollars. Uh, and what you do is, you, you know, if you just chunk through the algebra, you find what this means is that sellers express a willingness to accept that is below, OK, I've almost certainly got this wrong. Uh, sellers should ex express a willingness to accept that is strictly above, yes, I flipped these inequalities, that is strictly above their value. Um, buyers ex express a willingness to pay that is strictly below. So these multidimensional models of loss aversion generate this kind of willingness to accept, willingness to pay gap. Now, I want to have a caveat here, which is that in experiments, it turns out that this gap between willingness to accept and willingness to pay is somewhat sensitive to experimental procedure. In particular, imagine we made the following four modifications all at once. We replace the market mechanism with a truthful elicitation device, like a Becker de Groot Marshak mechanism. We add training for subjects where we explain the mechanism to them in great detail. We add practice rounds where subjects you know, just play the game four or five times before they actually get around to the real stakes version. 
and we add anonymity. So nobody, you know, no subject gets to, no, nobody else gets to observe whether you're buying or selling, possibly with protections for the experimenters, you know, knowing who you are as well. It turns out that if you add all these four things together, that closes the gap, uh, which is not to say that the effect isn't real when we find it, but that there are conditions for finding this which are perhaps a little bit sensitive. Um, we also know other things that limit the endowment effect. For instance, uh, there's some evidence that if you're a buyer and you've already budgeted to spend something, you don't view that spending as a loss. And there's some evidence that if you're a seller and you've been, you know, you've got the stuff that you're intending to sell, you don't view selling it as a loss. Now, it turns out that one way to try to integrate some of this contrary evidence is to make the reference point endogenous. So, so far, um, I've just sort of chosen the reference point in a hand wavy ad hoc fashion to fit the examples and the evidence that we had. Uh, but of course, you might quite reasonably worry that when I'm allowed to move around the reference point in response to the example, that there's a lot that I can rationalize. Uh, so I think the, probably the classic way to do this is Kosegi Raven 2006, which essentially says that the reference point is just determined by the expectations the player has. So the decision maker approaches a problem, has some expectation, for, you know, there's a distribution over consumption levels or a distribution over amounts of mugs and so on that the decision maker expects. And the decision maker evaluates gains and losses relative to this distribution. Uh, now, this is one quite neat way of tying our hands, of making sure that we don't have the freedom in each new situation to pick the reference point we like. Um, it's also, if you think of this version of the model, a plausible way to try to rationalize the stuff on the last slide. So why might it be that adding lots of practice rounds uh, reduces the endowment effect? One explanation could be that if you have a lot of practice rounds, you come to view the mug not as something you own, but as something that you might very well expect to sell. And if you're already expecting to sell the mug, then it's not a loss when you actually do sell the mug. Similarly, if you're a store owner, you're probably buying inventory with the expectation you're going to manage to sell it. So your reference point is not having all the inventory and losing it, it's having managing to sell probably most of it. Uh, now, of course, there's a problem here, which is that your expectations affect the choices you make, but in a rational expectations model, your choices affect the expectations you should hold. So there's some fine issue of seeking a kind of personal equilibrium. It needs to be that the choices generate the expectations, and the expectations generate the choices. And sometimes there can be multiple personal equilibria. So Kosegi Rabin have a, uh, have a way of selecting down from those. They suggest you should get what they call a preferred personal equilibrium, which is as though uh, the decision maker gets to pick ex ante which personal equilibrium she would like to be in. OK, so that's one, I think, important extension to this model. Um, but I think there's an extension which is not completely done. And Moshe has some beautiful work on this, I think, right? It, that for which there's also some new work uh, in Behavioral EC 2019. Uh, how can we use these multidimensional loss aversion or endowment effect models when we don't have additive separability? Like there are a bunch of technical reasons why we found it quite difficult to write down versions of these models where you have an endowment effect when there are lots of dimensions. What is, what is your endowment? What does it mean to say something is a loss from your endowment? What's a gain? Uh, and I think one, one quite open question is finding first good tractable formalizations of this and testing this. And I think we're only in the early stages of of actually exploring this terrain. And I actually suspect that the, uh, the focus in the AGT community about formalizing different forms of substitution and different forms of complementarity might mean that this community has an advantage in being able to think about what it would mean for us to have endowment effects and loss aversion in a world like this. But anyway, if you want to see you know, in this particular, you know, this week, some of the work on that, I think it's worth having a look uh, at this paper on Friday. Yeah. Um, 
so, so, so I don't, I, I, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying uh, do it carefully and think carefully about what you're doing, um, right? And in particular, I think uh, this actually leads on quite well to the next slide, uh, thinking about both the area of applicability of a theory and what a theory is meant to do, right? So, you know, okay, so, so, so just, just to be clear that these are common mistakes, I remember somewhere in my third year of grad school, I was incredibly happy with some model I'd come up with, uh, because the thing about that model was that no matter which anomaly I threw at it, I could find some specification of the model that generated that anomaly. Uh, and it took me quite a while to realize why that made it quite a bad model. Uh, and certainly, you know, part of this about generating theory is being in touch with what the evidence is and being aware that at least some of the evidence from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s comes from the dark age of p-hacking. Uh, and some of this comes from a willingness to realize that like, there's much more to what makes a good theory than just its ability to, you know, to, to, to explain the data. Um, and in particular, I think a very natural question to ask early on is what kind, who you're trying to model, right? What the scope of your theory is, whether you're thinking of amateurs or professionals, high stakes games or low stakes games, whether you're thinking of initial play or experience play. And by the way, you know, neither of these is necessarily more important. There are some situations that we encounter many times, and there are some situations that we encounter exactly once, right? I get to make one consumption savings decision for my retirement over the course of my life. I don't get repeats. Um, but there are some things I get to play many times. These are all different things that you might legitimately write a theory about. Familiar environments versus unfamiliar, individuals versus firms versus, I don't know, countries and militaries. Uh, these aren't wrong questions, but they're distinct questions, and it's worth thinking about the scope of a theory before you start writing the theory. Um, but a related thing is these are like a bunch of norms that seem obvious in hindsight, uh, but took me a while to absorb, so I thought it might be worth making them explicit. Um, every good theory is a prohibition, right? It's not a virtue of a theory that it accounts for all behavior or all data. Um, in particular, there's a trade-off between both including what we do observe and excluding what we don't, right? Like, one very easy theory to make is anything goes. And anything goes is a bad theory. Uh, and we should have some tolerance for a theory not being able to account for some behavior if, in general, it's quite a tight and restrictive theory, because restrictive theories are the things that are actually putting money on the table. They're the theories that are actually trying to generate predictions. A related thought is that a good theory should tie the analyst's hands. And this relates to this question of how we pick reference points, right? Um, we should both have mathematical precision within the theory, uh, which should hopefully come to us all naturally, and norms that map the world to the theory. That's to say that, that you know, it shouldn't be that you know, Nicole can look at a situation and translate this into one version of the model, and I can look at the situation and translate it into another version of the model, and then we can both yell at each other about interpretation. Part of what accompanies a good theory is a set of norms that says to people, here's the math, and when you encounter a situation in the world, here's the right way to translate that situation into the math. So one example of that that's, I think, perfectly standard in industrial organization and economics, we say the players are firms, right? And that norm, you know, while not always true, nonetheless generates agreement and makes the theory something that is precise and testable so that we're not at least you know, just disagreeing about different ways to write down the world. Um, a related thought is that we should try not to peek at the game before making a prediction, uh, which is to say you know, we're all familiar with the thought that if you, you know, if you look at your data many times before you run a statistical test, that's not a real statistical test. But there's something equally to be said about the weakness of theories that need you to have seen the game in order to write them down properly, right? Because otherwise, you know, I can generate a theory that will do pretty well. My theory is that Itai is really good at predicting human behavior. Uh, and whenever I see a game, my prediction is whatever Itai says will happen. So I'm going to just pass the game to Itai. He will write down his prediction. That's the theory. Now, that's, that, that clearly doesn't count as a good theory, right? But there are much milder versions of this that we do all the time. One version of this that we did do for many years is we said, you have the freedom to pick the reference point. You have you know, you get to see the situation and you get to decide whether the reference point is the status quo or, 
you know, the reference point is what you were hand, you know, what, what you physically hold in your hands. And that, you know, that wasn't great. So having these kinds of ways of tying your hands is important to writing a good behavioral theory. And a related thought is not to worry too much if you find a single falsification for your theory. Because for basically every behavioral theory, there exists a falsification. And in fact, that's true also for the classical theories. And I think it helps to think of a theory as having sort of multiple dimensions of what makes it good. One dimension is that it should be portable. That's to say, I should be able to take a standard situation that everybody else is interested in modeling, and I should be able to slot this theory on, on top without needing to gather new data or make lots of extra assumptions. Um, you know, tractability, just being able to solve it, right? The, the, the reason why that sort of simple, additively separable eta lambda version of loss aversion managed to take off was not because that's necessarily a great description of what goes on in the human mind, but it was a great compromise between fitting the data and being something that you could actually use and solve day to day. Um, and lastly, of course, accuracy, right? Like we would like both to include the things that do happen and exclude the things we don't. And in some sense, um, you know, one reason to tolerate single falsifications of theories is that we kind of have to use theory for a lot of the work we want to do. Uh, and in order to reach theories that are better, we sometimes need to just try things out. So I guess one thing to say is not to get too anxious about you know, falsifications, at least individually. All right, um, so that was a lot of quite informal stuff, uh, but I think it's worth pausing if anybody has questions. Cool, okay, so what I'm gonna do is do a lightning, lightning twirl of uh, solution concepts in behavioral game theory. Uh, so, beauty contest games. Uh, these are these I think sparked off some, some some really interesting work in behavioral game theory. The thought is that we're going to pick integers between zero and hundred, and we're going to give a prize to the player whose action is closest to p times the average choice. We're going to split ties. We're gonna, if, if there's a tie, we'll split the prize evenly between the players who, have, you know, who are tied. Now, the thing about these games is that if p is strictly less than one, there's a unique rationalizable strategy, right? which is that we should all pick zero. Because whatever the average is, my best response is to pick less than the average. There's only one fixed point, it's zero. And in fact, you can get at it by uh, iteratively deleting strictly dominated strategies. Uh, now, one thought is, Suppose we have 15 to 18 subjects and we repeat the game four times. You know, a natural question is, what does this look like if p is a half or if p is 2 thirds? Uh, now, I don't know. Does anybody want to actually make a guess? Somebody who hasn't seen the data before? OK, so classical theory, both rationalizability and Nash equilibrium have a sharp prediction. It should all be at zero. And this is what happens. So where p is a half, uh, you can see very few people are picking zero. Uh, and the mass points are at, uh, that is at exactly 50, that's at 25, that's at 12. And when p is 2 thirds, you can see the mass point there is 66. I think that's 33. Um, I think that might be, uh, so that's, I think, 2 thirds of 50? I forget. Anyway, the point is that, yeah? Oh, so we're going to play this once and then award the prize, and then that same group plays it again. Four times. This data is aggregating all four times. So people have had some chances to best respond to what they saw the last round if they think that's a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah, we just added them all into one histogram. Yeah, I know, but this was, this was the graph that was in the paper. They might have something in the appendix that disaggregates, but I don't know. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to defend this choice of graph. 
So one way to think about what's going on in these kinds of beauty contest games is, these kinds, is, is to have what's called a level K model. So the thought is that we take some finite normal form game, and we say that a strategy profile alpha is consistent with level K play if there exists a hierarchy of strategy profiles alpha 0 upwards and population frequencies lambda 0 upwards, such that for every player and for every K, the strat that's a mech strategy uh, of player i at level k is the best response to the level just below, to the play of the other players at the level just below, and of course, uh, having the requirement that the actual population distribution is just equal to the sum over the different levels of what each level is playing. So it's worth thinking what the parameters in this theory are. Um, the parameters are uh, the, strategy, the level 0 strategy profile alpha 0, the population frequencies lambda 0, lambda 1, lambda 2. Uh, and in fact, a hidden parameter here is what we're going to do when the best response is not singleton, right? which is going to be frequent in some kinds of games. Um, now, typically, notice that I can literally fit any data if you let me put everybody into lambda 0. right? If, I can say, all right, whatever data I have, that is the zeroth level play, and everybody is a level zero player. So typically, to avoid that, uh, we say that there are no zero level types. And moreover, if you take a mixture model and lab data, uh, those tend to suggest that there don't exist any types uh, for whom the level is greater than, is greater than four. Now, a natural variation of this is a cognitive hierarchy model, which is that instead of best responding to the level just below you, you best respond to the average of the levels below you, all the levels below you, uh, where that average is taken with respect to the true population frequencies of those levels. So this, it turns out, provides a rationalization of some of this stuff, right? If you think of level zero as, say, you know, uniform random, or here, if you think of level zero as 100, then 50 is level 1, 25 is level 2, and so on. Um, and similarly, though this doesn't fit quite so neatly for this p equals 2 thirds, that also provides some amount of fit. Um, some comments about this? I don't know. Um, you know. If you're seeing this model for the first time, it's worth thinking if you like it. I mean, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What are the, you know, where could we improve? Yeah. Um, so, so the usual thing to do, right, is to either say one of two things. The reference point is whatever is salient. Goodness knows how we fill that in. Or the reference point is uniform random, uh, which is sort of I think right now the de facto industry standard in experiments, if you're, running, uh, if you're running a lab experiment and you're fitting a level K model, you're generally assuming uniform random with a few exceptions. For instance, in mechanism design, sometimes people think that truthfulness is a good level zero, although I'm not sure why that should be true. Um, all right, so I, I guess one thing to note is that level K does all right for beauty contests although it was kind of designed for games like beauty contests. So maybe, you know, I don't know how surprising that is. Uh, but one of the uh, papers that's in fact, so, so this, Liang and Feudenberg 2019, is in the Highlights Beyond EC session. It's a beautiful combination of uh, experimental economics and machine learning. Some of their data suggests that level K does pretty well, uniform random level K does pretty well for predicting play in small matrix games. So I think three by three matrix games. Uh, now, notice, of course, that if the best response is fat, right, as in, say, a second price auction, uh, you might get quite a weak prediction out of a level K model. And of course, alpha 0 is a pretty big parameter space. Um, right? Like a, a full theory for level K would need to give us a function from games to level 0 play in, in order to close the model. And 
both of the prevalent ways of closing the model have a few bugs. So uh, if I say that alpha 0 is uniform random, that in fact creates a lot of hidden problems because um, lots of situations in the world where we want to model don't come to us with labels. So you can imagine if I'm deciding to go into work, right? one way of modeling this is to say I can either go to work or stay home. Another way to model this is to say I can go to work on the red bus, go to work on the blue bus, or stay home. And when I say that level 0 is uniform random, these are going to create wildly different predictions about level 0 play for me, and that's going to echo, echo on up, up the hierarchy. Um, setting alpha 0 equals to the salient actions is, of course, peaking, uh, because we have no formal theory of salient actions. Um, it's also got fairly weak predictive power if you let these lambdas, these population frequencies, vary from game to game in an unstructured way. But in fact, like the empirical evidence suggests that they do vary from game to game. So uh, this experimental economics paper does just a variety of uh, within subject comparisons across different games, and they find that there is essentially no correlation with, between the level that you play in one game fitted in a mixture model and the level you play in other games. Uh, similarly, this paper, uh, what this paper does is it takes different games where uh, you can cleanly figure out which level people are on the mixture models, and it varies both the magnitude of the incentives and the information you have about your opponent. So you might say to someone, your opponent in this case is very smart. Uh, and in fact, you might do that in a way that's uh, sort of, that's credible. So you might say, your opponent's very smart, here's the score they had on a math test before the game. Uh, what they find is varying this information varies the levels that people play. So all of that is to say that uh, this also is a part of the theory where it's not satisfying to have it be constant across games, but also we don't yet have any systematic way to try to pin it down uh, how it varies and when it varies. Oh, excellent. OK, so we've got, uh, we've got yet another. OK, so this is yet another case where hopefully EC is going to make progress in a case where, uh, you know, where we've been stalled for a long time. Oh, Gali says that there's a paper in behavioral EC, right? OK, um, so this is, I guess, another leading bit of behavioral game theory, uh, quantal response equilibrium. And this is essentially just, I think, a very natural way of thinking about how people might make errors. It says, look, uh, the costlier an error, the less likely you are to make that error. And the way it goes is you say, give me some finite normal form game, I'm going to add for each player, some vector of mean zero shocks that are distributed according to some joint density. And these are like shocks to the player's assessment of the utility of each action. So facing some opponent stra mech strategy profile, the agent chooses uh, an action to maximize this is their actual utility playing against those strategy profiles plus the shocks for each action. Um, now, that immediately implies some quantal response function Q. And as you might imagine, a quantal response equilibrium is just a fixed point of that function. That's to say it's a distribution such that, given that I have correct beliefs about the distribution of everybody else's play, my noise, I'm playing a noisy best response to everybody else's actions. So one interpretation of this is that this is uh, having some, some form of calculation error by the players. Uh, another view of this is to say what's going on here is that we, the analysts writing down the game, can only imperfectly measure utility, and we're just trying to smooth out Nash equilibrium to be robust to calculation errors by the analyst. Now, one thing about QRE, right, which is a little bit odd, is it says this. I, in fact, perfectly understand and predict the distribution of everybody else's actions which means I must, you know, in some sense, understand their trembles. But I still tremble. Uh, but that is just the way the theory is written down. Uh, 
So an immediate question is whether QRE is different from just calculating some Nash equilibrium and adding logistic noise. And it turns out that it is, right? It turns out that QRE can have this self-reinforcing feature where the fact that I think you're going to make certain mistakes that are not too costly for you changes my action systematically, which can then change your action systematically. Uh, so you know, these are a distinct beast from just Nash equilibrium with noise. Now, the usual version of this people use is logit QRE. That's to say we're going to assume that uh, you know, the sort of usual logistic best response function, uh, which is upper hemi-continuous giving us existence. A natural conjecture you might have is that as we make the players more and more accurate, so as they take this lambda to infinity so that you play almost surely your best response, uh, the limit of a sequence of logit QREs is trembling hand perfect. It turns out that's not true, uh, though the counterexample maybe isn't that illuminating. Uh, uh, trembling hand perfect, that's to say, uh, this is Selton's notion of perfection? Yes. Cool. Oh, um, we're having a... Uh, K is for each action, right? You have K is indexing each individual action, right? I'm saying you're picking the action AIK, and each action is being hit with, a, with an action-specific shock. That's all that's going on with the Ks. Cool? So I think one thing to note is that QRE seems to do better than standard Nash in a lot of lab experiments. It turns out that people do make mistakes, and those mistakes are at least somewhat correlated with how costly they are. Uh, and you know, costly mistakes are less likely than, least, than, than less costly mistakes. And so you know, in this variety, all pay auctions, first price, coordination games, um, the traveler's dilemma. Now, in all of these experiments, uh, it turns out that logit QRE, so even making the restriction that this is a logistic best response, uh, tends to do better than Nash. Uh, a side note is that logit QRE does not do so well in things like second price and ascending auctions, uh, even in its extensive form version. So there's a generalization of logit QRE to extensive forms. Uh, and the reason for that let me see if I can get this right. Um, there tends to be fairly systematic overbidding in second price auctions, and logit QRE turns out to be fairly sort of agnostic about the direction of errors. So you know you get you get of course errors when you put them into second price auctions, but you get none of the sort of systematic structure on the errors that would be interesting. Uh, now, there's one I think quite strong claim that was made, which is that QRE uh, almost always explains the direction of deviations should, from Nash and should become the static benchmark. Um, I think this might be a little bit strong. Um, in particular, one important challenge for QRE is that Nash equilibrium has a lot of useful invariances to the way we write the game down. And logit QRE just doesn't have that, right? Um, Lots of real world situations don't come with labels. And if I was going to have a bargaining game, you could well imagine that I could specify the action set in any one of these three ways, right? And it seems almost ludicrous that the discretization of the, you know, choosing different discretizations for the counter offers I can make a player will systematically affect the probability that you accept an offer in the logit QRE, which, is, which should not happen. Uh, now, a very natural thought is, OK, OK, uh, all of that is to say that logit QRE you know, is the problem. The problem is that whatever noise is hitting these things, if you know, there's some shock that affects my ability to evaluate a counteroffer of 100, it should be highly correlated with the shock of a counteroffer of 99. If I can choose between accepting and accepting loudly, the shock should be exactly the same for both of these things. So I should allow a, a richer and more detailed structure of distributions and correlations, and maybe that will solve the problem. It turns out that that's problematic for its own reason, uh, because allowing that, in fact, removes most of the uh, empirical content from QRE in a single game. So 
turns out that if you get any, give me any finite normal form game and any fully met strategy profile, I can find uh, distributions of the noise independent across actions such that alpha is a QRE of G. That's to say, you know, if you let me, if you impose on me independence, but you allow me to pick whatever distribution I like for each marginal, I can rationalize any alpha. And if you impose that they all have the same marginals, but you allow me to relax independence, so say that the evaluation noise for an offer of 100 is highly correlated with the evaluation noise of an offer for 99, then again, I can rationalize anything. And so what that says is that logit QRE gets its empirical content not just from having identical marginals and not just from having independence, but by having both of them together, um, which suggests that there is, in fact, an important sort of open questions to do with how, if at all, we can make QRE have content in a single game, given that we know that individually imposing independence or identical marginals isn't enough, and imposing them both together leads to these weird bugs out there. Questions? Um, so I don't think this is a killer blow per se. And the reason for that is that um, logit QRE still has content across multiple games, right? Or, or in fact, Q, e, e, even, you know, sorry, sorry. This is a theorem for single games, right? So if I was to, in principle, collect data from multiple interactions, QRE could, if I had a theory about how the noise term was related across games, I could still falsify QRE by collecting data from multiple games. And logit QRE is one example of how you might think a noise term is related across games, but there could be others. And so I guess I don't see this as a killer blow so much as a word of caution that the applicability of, logit, of, of QRE may depend a lot on its logistic structure and that there are bugs with that and it's really an open question about how we should get around that. Yes. Yes. In, in, in fact, uh, this is the problem, it turns out, in ascending auctions, uh, that if your value is 100, there are many, many, many more ways to quit before 100 than there are to reach 100, especially when you account for combinatorial structures of the game tree, right? There are, you know, different strategies that specify different off-path actions, and should we count those in the normal form? So, so yeah, um, like, this is a, this is a problem. Uh, and I don't think I know how to fix it. So here's a thought. Uh, ha has, has anybody here encountered the wallet game before? So, you know, the story here goes something like this. Imagine that what I did was, you know, I randomly confiscated two people's wallets. Uh, and let's suppose for the moment that the money in these wallets is uniformly distributed between zero and one. And then we run an ascending auction for these two people to buy back their wallets. So independently and uniformly distributed between zero and one. Now, a naive bidding strategy is to say this, look, I know exactly how much money I have in my wallet. I have some amount theta i, right? Um, on average, there's 0.5 in the other person's wallet. So what I should do is I should bid until the price hits theta i, sorry, th theta i plus a half, right? Yes, you win both wallets. The, the auction is I've confiscated two people's wallets, and if you win the auction, you get both. So you know how much is in your wallet. You know that there's theta i. You say, well, on average, there's a half in the other person's wallet. So what I should do is I should bid until it's the amount in my wallet plus a half, and then I should quit. Now, there's something wrong with this bidding strategy. What's wrong with it? Well, at the point where I reveal it, it's too late for the other person to do anything about it, 
right? When I quit, they've won. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm doing an ascending auction, but there are only two players. So when he drops, you're done. There's no need to do an update, right? Like you don't need to write down your contingent strategy for after he drops. If he drops, you've won. Yeah. Conditional on you winning, right? That's bad news uh, about how much money is in the other person's wallet. It turns out that the uh, symmetric base Nash equilibrium of this game is that you should quit at twice the amount of money in your own wallet. Now, this is a bit of a weird equilibrium, right? Because imagine you've got, you know, 20, you know, 0.25 in your wallet. This strategy says you should quit at 0.5. But at the point where you're called to quit, right, the other person is playing this same strategy. So when the price is equal to you know, twice of your value, you know that your opponent's type is at least 0.5 times the price. So the expected value of the object is, in fact, strictly higher than the price. So even though this is the symmetric Bayes-Nash equilibrium, it has this odd property that at the point you quit, the expected value of the object to you is positive. OK, so it should maybe not surprise you that when human beings play this game in the lab, they don't, they don't do that. Uh, they do something much more like that. Um, so this is weird, right? The winner in the symmetric base Nash equilibrium always has non-negative payoffs. The winners at the naive strategy profile sometimes have negative payoffs. This is a winner's curse, right? Like, and that, of course, happens much more generally in a lot of other auction-like games that people underestimate uh, or, or people don't account for the information conveyed by winning. Uh, so this is, I think, the leading formalization of the winner's curse. Uh, the thought is that each player is going to underestimate the degree to which her opponent's actions are related to her private information. So uh, we've got a Bayesian game. There's a set of players. Each has actions. They have utility functions. They have types. They have uh, probability distribution over types. So a strategy profile sigma right, is a profile of mech strategy. Well, no, let's, let's go with pure. There's a profile of pure strategies for the agents that are functions from their types into their actions. If you give me some sigma, that's to say some strategy profile, a function from types into actions for each agent, and some probability distribution over types. That gives me a joint distribution over types and actions. And cursed equilibrium essentially says this, that the players correctly understand the marginal distributions. They understand the distribution of the opponent's actions conditional on their own type, and the distribution of their opponent's types conditional on their own type but they don't understand the correlation between these two things. They don't understand, for instance, how higher types in the wallet game mean higher actions from the opponent. They underappreciate this. So the thought is that it's almost as though with some probability, independent of the opponent types, everybody plays the uncon all the opponents play the unconditional distribution of their actions. So, this is one way of representing, in a sort of hacky way, but it turns out really useful and tractable way, the idea that you're not wrong about the sort of major statistics, right? The distribution of actions and the distribution of types, but you don't appreciate the way types and actions of your opponents relate to each other, which in an interdependent values world like that um, wallet game implies that, you, uh, implies that you're playing wrongly. You're misperceiving something about your opponent's strategies. OK, so we could talk about the average strategy of my opponents averaged over their type. So this is when I have type theta i. The probability that everybody else plays a minus i is just this. I'm taking the sum over different opponent type profiles, the probability of those different types. The, the, sorry, the probability condition on my type that that's their type profile and the probability that they play that action profile conditional on that being the type profile. And we'll say that some strategy profile is a chi cursed equilibrium if for all players and all types, for all 
actions in the support of that, that type's strategy. So we are dealing with mech strategies. Sorry for being confused. Uh, that action is the best response to this object. So this thing is the probability that my opponents have these types conditional on my type, the utility that I would get from that, but then I'm distorting it in the following way. Uh, I'm multiplying it by this thing, which is the true probabilities of these actions given their types. But this thing here is the averaged probabilities above. So it's like as though with probability chi, all of my opponents, instead of playing their assigned true strategies, are playing the unconditional distribution of their actions. It's as though with probability chi, they're ignoring their types, but playing the correct distribution over actions. So this is neat insofar as it ties your hands a lot, uh, and it's very portable, right? You give me any interdependent values Bayesian game, and I can write down what the cursed equilibrium for that game is. It's got a single parameter, right? So there's not too much of a worry of me being able to pick things however I like, where I, by, by picking chi, I can scale between chi equals 0 is just Bayes Nash equilibrium, chi equals 1 is fully cursed equilibrium. Um, and in fact, notice this term here, right, is the only way that all of this stuff is affecting what the, maxim what the maximizer is if we are under private values so that my utility doesn't depend on theta minus i, cursed equilibrium and base Nash equilibrium are the same. So this, if you take this kind of model and you apply it to the wallet game, then you get something that looks a bit more like actual behavior. Right? So the thought is that when chi equals 0, there's a unique symmetric 0 cursed equilibrium where you bid exactly uh, the, base, the base Nash equilibrium strategies. But when chi equals 1, you're fully cursed and you do exactly the naive thing, right? You say, look, I understand my opponent is, you know, bidding in a way that's uncorrelated with their type. That's what I think is happening. Therefore, winning conveys no additional information about their type. Therefore, in fact, the best response to that distorted belief about my opponents is to bid until the price is equal to my type plus a half, because their actions are not informative. Um, and more generally, it turns out that when chi is positive and n is large enough, uh, the expected payoff condition on winning this kind of game is negative. So you get a kind of general winner's curse. And this applies not just to the wallet game, but to a lot of co uh, common value auctions. It turns out that cursed equilibrium, as you would hope from the name, uh, does appropriately produce as behavior the winner's curse. Questions? So one, 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 one small subtlety that is maybe worth pointing out is this is implicitly as though uh, there's a single coin flip, right? A chi-weighted coin flip, where if it comes up heads, then every, I'm going to take it as though everybody's ignoring. You could imagine ignoring their private information. You could imagine a world where we had an alternative specification of this model of independent coin flips, one for each agent, because it does seem kind of odd to think that with some probability, everybody is going to coordinatedly ignore their private information. Uh, it again turns out that this version of the model is a lot more tractable to use in applications, um, which is not to say that it's necessarily a better version for fitting behavior than the version where we think it's independent. Um, it turns out this is one of these classic auctions papers, experimental auctions papers from the 80s, uh, that cursity, if you take their data from Kegel and Levine, these are common value, I think, affiliated interdependent values auctions. And you fit, uh, you try to, uh, you fit the data for, let me see. Where is this? You try to fit different chi's based on their data. Uh, you find that you get, you know, sort of, Values, so remember, chi is the probability you think everybody else is ignoring their private information. Uh, for a lot of these auctions, it's as though you think with about probability somewhere between a half and 
0.75 or 0.8, everybody else is ignoring their private information. So if you're asking the model to tell you how much people are neglecting this, it seems like the answer comes back quite often, right? They substantially don't account for the information value of winning. Um, now, this doesn't seem to do so well for these auctions with just three bidders in them. You can see those are values for Kai that make no sense at all, right? It's as though with probability greater than one, everybody is ignoring their private information, which strains that interpretation of what's going on. So that's to say, actually, that the degree of overbidding that you observe in auctions with low numbers of bidders is greater than you can reasonably rationalize using the cursed equilibrium model. That in order to get cursed equilibrium to predict that degree of overbidding, you have to overshoot the amount of overbidding that would be predicted if you were to think that everybody was completely ignoring their private information, if you were to hold that mistaken conjecture about your opponents. Um, questions? Mm -hmm. Sorry, the actual. Right. Right, right. So there's there, there's a difficulty here, right, which is that overbidding is, is is common. Well, sometimes even occurs under private values. And cursed equilibrium has no explanation for that because it's equivalent to base Nash on the private values. And maybe, you know, I agree, it would be nice to see some way to like partial out how much of this is that kind of error, which couldn't possibly be explained by cursedness, and how much of this is neglect. Um, just one more example that this, it turns out, is a pretty robust. Uh, experiment you can run. What you can do is you can say, look, we're acquiring a company. So there are two players, a seller and a buyer. The seller's type is uniform on 0, 1. Uh, and the company is worth theta s to the seller, his type, and one and a half times theta s to the buyer. Now the buyer gets to make an offer, some price, and the seller chooses to take it or leave it. Now, uh, we've picked these parameters very carefully. In particular, this is a market for lemons. Uh, for any price, the set of sellers whose type is below that price is such that in expectation, you lose money by offering that price. So the unique Bayes-Nash equilibrium is that you offer a zero price to the seller. The experimental data suggests that when people do this, they offer positive prices and they offer them pretty persistently. So even after repeating this game 10 times with feedback, so people are seeing that they sometimes lose money, uh, they don't figure out that they should be offering a zero price. Uh, now, this is also, of course, predicted by cursed equilibrium, right? What's, what's happening is people are ignoring the fact that having your offer be accepted is really pretty bad news about the value of the company. Uh, you might worry that this is just because people don't understand what uniform distributions are. The anomaly persists even when you substantially sim simplify the distribution. Um, it persists even when you're absolutely clear with players about the dependence of uh, the decision to accept an offer with the type. So you can replace the seller with a computer player. You can write in the instructions. The computer player will accept your offer if and only if his type is below your offer, and you still get essentially the same result. Uh, so this seems like a pretty robust experiment. I mean, I don't, you know, to be honest, it's not even like I've made up my mind on a lot of stuff here. So if you could help me make up my mind, that would be that would be grand. Uh, what do you think? Do you? Do, do you like this? Do you not like it? What could be better?
how would you fit chi? Well, what you do, so I would look, I would look at what, um, so I think this is Eister Rabin 2005 that produces this table. Uh, I might be wrong. I bet what they're doing is they've got some sort of logistic errors model. And so it's, you know, you're, you're, you're doing some kind of maximum likelihood fit with logistic errors. But that's, that's just me guessing based on what experimenters typically do. I'm not completely sure how they produce this table. Um, one thing to notice is that this is parsimonious. It's pretty tractable. And at least in games where there are interdependent values, allowing for at least some cursiveness seems to be more in line with what we observe than base Nash equilibrium. People do seem to neglect this somewhat. And if I had to, rather than fit into data, like commit in advance to a chi, I would probably commit in advance to a chi somewhere around a half. Um, but notice that these errors that get attributed to cursedness persist even in these one-player games, even with a literal computer player on the other side. And in these games, cursed equilibrium and base Nash equilibrium are technically equivalent, right? When there's no other players, then you know, in, 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 in all one-player games, cursed equilibrium is just base Nash. Um, and what that is to say is that like ignoring the interaction between your opponent's information and their actions seems like a special case of a more general class of ignorance, right? where you're ignoring some feature of a joint distribution. And we don't, in fact, have a full theory of how this fundamental phenomenon actually works. Right? There's some evidence that this might be related to what gets called contingent reasoning. Um, and so you know, there's some evidence that this is like people are having difficulty thinking through multiple contingencies for what may happen and integrating those into a best response. And in particular, uh, this paper, uh, Martinez, Maquina, Nidalee, and Vespa, has a really interesting change you can make to these acquiring a company games. So rather than saying the company's value is uniformly distributed, you know, from zero to, you know, from zero to one, what they say is, look, you're going to play this acquiring a company game. There are a hundred companies. One of these has value 0 0.01, one of these has values 0 0.02, and so on. You're going to make the same offer to all the companies. And then you know, you're going to be paid for the sum of these games. And it turns out that this fairly drastically cuts down uh, the rate of errors uh, in the acquiring a company game. It takes it, I mean, it, they don't all go away, but this knocks out, this cuts the number of errors in half. Um, so you go from a situation where I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to do the numbers off the top of my head, but like this, this results in a fairly large and this le results in a fairly drastic reduction even in early rounds. And so what that suggests is that there's something about thinking about probabilistic outcomes versus thinking about multiple deterministic outcomes that seems related to this inability to do this conditioning that cursedness is trying to model. Um, but we don't, in fact, have any formal theory about how that works. This is, this is insofar as I know, uh, an, an, an open question to formalize. Cool? Sir, is there an equivalent formulation of? So if, if, if there is an equivalence there, it's going to have to be quite subtle. I'm, I'm certainly not seeing it immediately. Um. Uh, right. So, so I think this is, um, I think part of the uphill battle of behavioral economics has been trying to show that we're not just fitting better because there are more parameters. 
And so I, I, I think that rather than a genuine belief that this is the same for all people uh, is the reason why you typically parameterize it in this way. Cool, okay. Um, so what I want to do then um, is to talk about some, some work that I and other people have been doing about uh, mistakes and dominant strategy mechanisms. Um, and some of you have seen this before. Um, and if you've seen this before, you should feel free to scupper off. Uh, but the thought, the thought that I want to get into is that we frequently try to design strategy-proof mechanisms. I don't know why we call them strategy-proof instead of truthful. Truthful does seem like an easier word. Uh, we want equilibrium dominant strategies. Uh, and we typically think this is useful because it makes it easier uh, for real human beings to participate in the mechanisms we design. It reduces the cognitive cost of doing so. It means you don't have to spy on each other. It reduces the waste that you have from espionage. And it helps people avoid mistakes, right? And the thing about mistakes is that it's very hard to put formal structure on mistakes, right? Like, if, if, if I know what your best response is, that's a precise thing. If you're confused about how the game works, you could be doing a lot of different things, and it may be hard for me to predict. So rather than trying to trick my players in the exactly optimal way, we might want it to be that we help them avoid mistakes so that we can have a more robust prediction of their behavior. Now, these benefits substantially depend on understanding that the game is strategy proof. Um, and it turns out that that is not, in fact, always true. So this is uh, human subjects data with four bidders per auction. Uh, these are 360 auctions in total. And these bidders are bidding for a private value cash prize. That's to say there's a, you know, it's as though there's a voucher. It's worth some amount between, I think, zero and $110 to the bidders. Um, they've got uh, affiliated values. It turns out that the, in, the, in the dominant strategy equilibria of these auctions, uh, they expect a $4 profit. The winner expects $4 of profit. So uh, this histogram shows the difference between the second highest bid and the second highest value in ascending clock auctions and in second price auctions. So blue is ascending clock. And what you can see essentially is that, you know, much of the mass is at zero. In fact, if I was to give you a more fine-grained histogram, which is a bit harder to read, you'd see this is essentially just one massive spike at zero. Um, and what you can see from the second price auctions is that, you know, sure, about 40% about of the time, the clearing price is where theory says it should be. And about 60% of the time, it's not. And in fact, it, you know, like a substantial fraction of the time, it's way, way off, right? It, it's more than $6 off in a game where you can expect, if you're the winner, $4 of profit. Um, OK, so this is not uh, predicted by any of the uh, game theoretic solution concepts we've gone through so far, right? Uh, these are dominant strategy auctions. There's a unique best response. If you're level one or above in a level K model, you bid your value. If you're in a QRE, uh, it turns out there's no systematic way to get this big a difference between these two auctions using QRE. QRE gives you roughly the same uh, magnitude of errors in both these auctions, assuming we're using logit QRE for its empirical content. And cursed equilibrium, of course, because these are private value games, has nothing to say about these games. Um, so it's, I think, been a folk wisdom for a while in auction theory that some strategy-proof mechanisms are easier to understand than others, in particular, that ascending auctions are easy for real bidders to understand, and second price sealed bid auctions just are not. Uh, and there's, like a, there's a really long line of experiments going back to the 80s uh, that finds this fairly robustly, that uh, players tend to make large and persistent mistakes in second price sealed bid auctions, overbidding on average, and that they very rapidly, often within the first two rounds of experiencing something, uh, understand that in an ascending auction, your dominant strategy is to bid your value. Uh, this is weird because these have the same reduced normal form. 
picking a price to quit at in an ascending auction is equivalent to picking a bid in a second price sealed bid auction. So, you know, quite strongly, theories that are written in the normal form have to make the same prediction for these games. So, a natural question to ask is, look, when is it obvious that a mechanism is strategy proof? That's to say, what properties of a game make it so that it's easy for somebody to see their dominant strategy? And so one thing we might do is we might try to find a stronger solution concept uh, that provides a formal standard of simplicity. That's to say it classifies games according to whether it thinks it's easy to find a dominant strategy. We might hope it to have some predictive power. Uh, it might do some job sorting out the cases where people play well and where they don't. And we might hope for it to be parsimonious, which is to say that you know, rather than writing a theory uh, that has you know, lots of new primitives that include the framing of a game, we might hope to write a theory that depends only on the basic primitives of classical game theory. Uh, now, of course, this means that we can't account for every kind of cognitive complexity. And I'm going to try to get into detail about the things that this really doesn't capture, even though they are important a bit later. So here's the thought. Um, let's call this strategy obviously dominant. So think of a mechanism as an extensive game form, where each history of that extensive game is associated with some unique outcome, say in an auction, who wins and how much they pay. A strategy is obviously dominative for all deviating strategies. At any earliest information set where these two strategies diverge, the best possible outcome from the deviation is no better than the worst possible outcome from the dominant strategy. And I'm going to call a mechanism obviously strategy proof if it has an equilibrium in these obviously dominant strategies. Now, an interesting feature of this definition is it turns out that second price sealed bid auctions are not obviously strategy proof, and ascending auctions are. Um, and let me try to uh, just be specific here. So earliest information sets where two strategies diverge. What are these? What do I mean? Um, so I'm going to use this function alpha to pick out the earliest points of departure. An information set is an earliest point of departure of two strategies, if and only if the two strategies choose different actions at that information set, and neither strategy rules out reaching that information set. So you can see down here, I've got an extensive game. Uh, there's a red strategy for player two. There's a blue strategy for player two. Uh, these are the information sets that are earliest points of departure. Uh, why isn't this one down there an earliest point of departure? Well, because playing blue rules out ever reaching that information set. Why isn't this one an earliest point of departure? Well, because both strategies rule out reaching that information set. So this function alpha takes as an input two strategies and produces as an output the information sets where they differ for the first time. OK, so this is the one piece of notation that I need. This is the utility to some agent i in some extensive game g. When we start play from some history h, so we might start play not just from the start of the game, but we might imagine starting play midway. Uh, play proceeds according to this strategy profile, and the resulting outcome is evaluated according to these preferences theta i. So we're implicitly looking at private value games, although you could obviously write this down for interdependent values if you wanted to. Um, so I'm going to use h0 to denote the initial history. This is the history that begins the game. So conceptually, this is the, as though everybody starts the game knowing their types. The randomization over types has already happened, but nobody has yet played any moves. And I'm going to call a strategy up there. That's the usual definition for weakly dominant. A strategy is weakly dominant if for all deviating strategies and for all opponent strategy profiles, the utility under the deviation is no better than the utility under the dominant strategy. And a strategy is obviously dominant if for all deviating strategies, at any information set that is an earliest point of departure, the best possible outcome, conditional, best possible payoff conditional on reaching that information set and playing according to the deviation is no better than the worst possible payoff conditional on reaching that information set and playing according to the dominant strategy. Now, 
you may not see this immediately, but this is a strictly stronger definition than the one on top. Obvious dominance implies weak dominance. I want to draw your attention to two parts of the machinery so we're transparent about what's going on. Um, the first part is an obvious difference between these two is that weak dominance looks at h0, the initial history, and s minus i, but it holds these constant across both sides of the inequality. It's a state-by-state -state comparison. Obvious dominance, by contrast, is looking at a best case on the left-hand side and a worst case on the right-hand side. Um, but a more subtle difference is that weak dominance is written in such a way that it only actually depends on the normal form of the game. Weak dominance starts looking at the initial history. So that means that if you take two games that reduce to the same normal form, they have the same weakly dominant strategies because weak dominance takes the view from the initial history. Obvious dominance looks at histories that are in information sets that are earliest points of departure. And the notion of an information set and an earliest point of departure is defined with respect to the game tree. So it depends on the extensive form. A corollary of this observation is that the standard revelation principle just doesn't apply. Right? If you take a game with an obviously dominant strategy and you reduce it to some normal form of simultaneous moves, that can destroy, and in fact often will destroy, the fact of its obviously dominant strategy. Cool. Questions before I go on? Jason, I'm hoping being better about notation. Cool. OK. Um, all right, so how does this sort, it, sort this out? Why does this actually do the classification that we might want it to? So this is a, a really easy second price sealed bid auction. Suppose player two's value is three. Now, one is going to bid 0, 2, or 4. Two is going to bid 1, 3, or 5. Now, the truth-telling strategy in blue is to bid three. One deviation is to bid five in red at the bottom. Now, the earliest point of departure of these strategies, that's pretty easy. That's this information set in green. What's the best thing that can happen? Ah, what's the worst thing? What's the best thing that can happen under the deviation conditional on hitting this information set? Well, one could bid 0, in which case 2 wins at a price of 0 for a surplus of 3. What's the worst thing that can happen? under the truth-telling strategy condition on hitting this information set, well, one could bid four, in which case two doesn't win. So the best outcome under the deviation is strictly more than the worst outcome under the truth-telling strategy, thereby establishing that while it's a dominant strategy to be truth-telling, it's not obviously dominant. Why doesn't this trick work in an ascending auction? So this is a simple ascending auction, right? You can, in fact, see its normal form equivalent to the second price auction we started from. Uh, one bids, one goes in or out, then we raise the price by a dollar and two goes in or out. We raise the price again, one goes in or out, just the usual thing. The truth-telling strategy for two is to bid until the price hits three and then quit. That same deviation is to bid until the price hits five and then quit. The earliest point of departure of these two strategies is this information set in green. Well, what's the best thing that can happen under the deviation? condition on hitting this information set? Well, once we hit this information set and two places a bid, the price is shot past $3. From his perspective, the best thing that can happen is that one keeps bidding so that two quits and doesn't win. On the other hand, the worst thing that can happen, in fact, the only thing that can happen at this information set under the truth-telling strategy is that two doesn't win which establishes that the best case scenario under the deviation is no better than the worst case scenario under the dominant strategy, so it's obviously dominant. Now, this sort of loops back to this idea that says maybe some of what's going on in, um, in the acquiring a company game is about a failure to think through contingencies. And without managing to completely explain behavior in that game, I'd like to show you a way to model an agent who's bad at thinking through state by state different contingencies that haven't realized yet. And so the thought here is, imagine that we've got this, this simple game. You know, player one prefers outcome A to B to C to D. Uh, now, in the game on the left, in game one here, it's a dominant strategy to play L, right? 
because one prefers A to B and one prefers C to D. Now in game two on the right, it's not a dominant strategy to play L any longer. In particular, if two is playing Z, then one wants to play R because he prefers B to D. Now you could imagine that if our agent wants to deduce that he has a dominant strategy in game one, he needs to think through things state by state. He says there are two states, two contingencies, either two plays Y or two plays Z. And if two plays Y, then I should play L since I prefer A to B. If two plays Z, then I should play L since I prefer C to D. Therefore, I should play L no matter what two is doing. And you could well imagine that if, if player one was kind of mixed up about this, right? If player one said, look, I understand that if I play L, I get A or B, sorry, I get A or C. I understand that if I play R, I get B or D, but I don't know how these are related state by state, contingency by contingency, then it might be as though player one is confused about which game he's playing. So it turns out that a, a, a quite tractable way to represent players who can't reason contingently is to represent them in terms of not knowing exactly which game they're playing. And here's how to do that. So I'm going to use this notion of an experience. The experience of some player i at some history h just records the information sets where that player was called to play and the actions that player took in order. I'm going to denote a sequence like that psi i. So you see, in these games, in some sense, they both generate the same experiences for player one. Right? The one thing that could happen is that if one is at the initial history, he's been called to play and he hasn't taken an action yet and the game can't end. At any history on the left branch, here or here, he's been called to play, he played left, and if the game ends, it ends in A or C. In any history on the right branch, he was called to play, he played right, and if the game ends, it ends in B or D. So one way to say our agent can't reason contingently is to say that he can't distinguish games that generate for him the same experiences. And so that I'm just going to take that idea and define it formally. So two extensive form games, G and G prime, are indistinguishable to player I if there exists some bijection going from I's information sets and actions in G to I's information sets and actions in G prime with the property that some sequence is an experience for player I in G, if and only if its image is an experience in G prime. And some experience could lead to an outcome in G, if and only if its image could lead to that same outcome in G prime. So the thought about this is just imagine I showed you only the experiences of a game. So you know all the sequences of times you may be called to play, all the things, all the actions you could choose at the times you're called to play, and as a function of any sequence of information sets and actions, what might happen. Now, this would let you evaluate for each cont continuation strategy all the possible outcomes. But you would not be able to know for each continuation strategy the possible outcomes conditional on some unobserved event, some event that's going to happen in the future or that has happened previously, but you don't know because your information set is big. So this defines a partition on the set of all mechanisms, and it prevents the agent from reasoning contingent on these kinds of unobserved events. And so here's a theorem. The thought is, imagine I've got the set of all games and I've imposed a partition, right? I've said some games our player can't distinguish. Now, it could be that a strategy is weakly dominant in one game, but it's not weakly dominant in the other games that our agent can't distinguish. So it turns out that I can use that little lambda bijection to keep track of the same strategy across different games in an equivalence class. So if a strategy is weakly dominant in one game, but not weakly dominant in the other games, then, well, our player doesn't know that it's a dominant strategy. On the other hand, it could be that that strategy is dominant not only in one game, but in all the games in the equivalence class, in which case we might say informally, well, our player knows that's a dominant strategy. It's obvious to him it's dominant. And so um, it turns out that that's true formally. A strategy is obviously dominant according to that inf soup definition I gave you earlier in G, if and only if for all G prime that are I indistinguishable from G, 
That strategy, kept track of using the bijection, is weakly dominant in G prime. So this is saying it's as though what's going on here is our player is confused about the exact nature of the game he's playing. For instance, in a second price auction, he knows for each bid that he either wins at a price less than or equal to his bid, or he doesn't win and pays nothing. But he doesn't know how state by state his action leads to different outcomes. So he can't identify his dominant strategy. On the other hand, in an ascending auction, he knows that he's going to see an increasing sequence of prices, that if he ever quits, he's out forever and pays nothing. But if he keeps bidding, he either wins at the current price, or the price rises, and he's asked to make the same decision again. And this partial description of the game tree suffices to verify his dominant strategy. And that's exactly what this is saying here. This notion of obviousness is exactly tracking this way of not understanding games. So a natural question right, is this, that we know that in these uh, neat auction-like environments, if I have quasi-linear utility and unit demand, every strategy proof mechanism is a pivot price mechanism. right? That's to say that you have to pay, if you win, you have to pay an amount equal to the least type you could have reported while still winning, plus some arbitrary function of all the other opponent's types. Right? That's, a that's a corollary of the green lafont holmstrom theorem, and it holds vice versa, vice versa as well. Right? Every pivot price mechanism is strategy proof. Now, a natural question is, is there an analog to that if we ask for this stronger notion of dominance? Or in particular, we might worry that, like, sure, this definition sorts out these two cases. It says ascending auctions are easy, second price auctions are difficult. But maybe it's just calling these two cases right. Like, what are its implications more generally? It turns out that, in fact, uh, the extensive form structure of an ascending auction is almost entirely pinned down by requiring obvious dominance. That's to say that in these same environments, every OSP mechanism is a personal clock auction, which is uh, a mount generalization of ascending auctions, uh, and vice versa. Uh, every personal clock auction is obviously strategy proof. So this thing where you know, I start at a low price and I ask you in or out, and if you quit, you're out, and if you're in, I raise the price and ask you again, is not just, in, in, in some sense, ascending auctions are not just an obviously strategy proof mechanism. Obvious strategy proofness is kind of the property of ascending auctions. Once you ask for this, it implies most of the game tree. Um, now, you might ask more generally, what happens if um, we don't have this neat universe of transfers? We've got some set of objects to allocate. And you know, any, any agent might have one of the objects as their favorite. For any pair of objects, the agent might prefer object A or might prefer object B. So this is a notion of rich preferences. Uh, Marek Pichia and Pete Troyan have a really beautiful paper on this. They show. Um, and this, by the way, is uh, the best paper for EC 2019, uh, assuming I've read Pete's website correctly. Uh, that, so it's, it's worth going to see. It's a really cool paper. I wish I had known how to do it. Uh, they show that with rich preferences and no transfers, every obviously strategy proof mechanism is a thing that they call a millipede game. And I won't get into exactly what these games are, but the thought is that it, they are a bit like serial dictatorships. You clinch at each point you're offered a set of objects. And you can either clinch one of them right away, or you can pass. And if you pass, then eventually you're going to be offered another set of objects, and there are some rules you know, governing which objects you're offered again when it comes back to you. Uh, and they show, you know, I, you know, they show a full characterization of obviously strategy-proof mechanisms. And moreover, they show that if you're willing to uh, have a certain str stronger solution concept that essentially encodes that each agent can only completely can, has incomplete foresight about his own future actions, then you can exactly pick out the dynamic random priority mechanism, a dynamic random, uh, a, a sequential random serial dictatorship. So they show that a mechanism is uh, efficient, fair, and strongly obviously strategy proof. You know those definitions see their talk to know, uh, even only if it's the dynamic random priority mechanism. Um, so this, in some sense, provides an explanation for the property of dynamic random priority. Now, I think an interesting thing is this. Um, 
when I realized that, so there are two ways to run a random priority mechanism, right? There are a set of objects, and we want to allocate the objects to a set of players. One thing I could do is I could ask everybody to simultaneously submit a rank order list and use random priority, right? Allocate, you know, go to the first highest priority player, he gets the highest object on his list, next player, the highest object that remains, next player, and so on. Um, or the other thing is I could get players to take turns to pick from the set that remains. It turns out, weirdly enough, that the simultaneous version is strategy proof, but not obviously strategy proof. And the sequential version is obviously strategy proof. To see why the simultaneous version is not obviously strategy proof, think of this. Imagine that instead of listing things in the order, if you list things in the order, say, from one, two, three, four, right, in your true order of preference, the worst case scenario is you could get four. But if you list things in the order two, one, three, four, you could get two, which is better than four. So it's not obviously strategy proof by the definition. Now, this is a bit weird. And certainly, when I encountered this fact, uh, my initial reaction was to say, like, that, that's got to be, like, that's got to be wrong. Like, surely these are both simple mechanisms. Uh, so what I did was I ran an experiment with, this is human subjects lab experiment. There are four players, four money prizes, and they have known common values. So they are, uh, the prizes are worth between nothing and $1.25 without any ties. Each player knows their priority score, which is a random integer between 1 and 10. Higher scores are going to go first. We break ties randomly. Players play for 10 rounds with feedback. So after each round, they see which prize they were allocated. In fact, they see the full allocation of prizes across players, and then we play again. Cool? So to be clear, right? all that's happening, the, the whole difference between these games here is that here, you're going to see a screen where you see the values of each money prize, right? Uh, you'll see at the point of choice how much money each prize is worth. Uh, you'll type a number from one to four next to each prize, and then we'll process this using the uh, random priority algorithm. And here, all that's happening is you're going to see a screen. There will be a bunch of prizes. The prizes that are taken already are grayed out. You pick a prize, and we go. OK. So a natural question is, how often do these end in the dominant strategy outcome? Uh, and the answer is that uh, in the static strategy proof version, about a third of the time, these don't result in the dominant strategy outcome. And in the obviously strategy proof dynamic random priority, these, end, these don't end about 7% of the time. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I wish I knew. Maybe people like giving money away. I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, the most common error is exactly this preference ordering, 2, 1, 3, 4. Uh, so you report the second highest prize first and the first highest prize second. Um, and it seems like reasonably persistent. So even if you look at the last five of the 10 rounds, uh, there's still uh, an appreciable gap between these two. And you might worry that something weird is happening because of repetition. So you can, uh, you can run just one round. This is a very, very short lab experiment. Uh, and you can multiply the stakes by 12 so that the highest price is $15 instead of $1.25. Uh, and you still get the same effect. Um, now, I don't want to claim this is the only explanation for what's going on. Uh, Matthew Rabin. Uh, and some of his co-authors have a paper suggesting that if you allow for uh, fairly high degrees of loss aversion, it ceases to be a dominant strategy to, uh, to list your true preferences in the strategy-proof random priority mechanism. Uh, now, I was a bit skeptical of this explanation, but it turns out that when you fit those kinds of models to this data, um, it gets a number of other comparative statics uh, pretty right. So for instance, uh, low priority players are far more likely to do what we would think of as a misrepresentation. This, it turns out, is also predicted by, uh, this is also predicted by models where the loss aversion parameter is something like lambda equals four or five. So losses have to count 
really sharply more than gains. Um, I think there are some problems with this uh, theory. One is that this is a theory only about when errors occur and not about what errors occur. And so in a pressing sense, it's incomplete, right? Um, you know, this is a classification. It says these are obvious, those are not, but we're being quiet about what's gonna happen if you run the mechanisms that are not obvious. And for all we know, maybe you could fool some of the people some of the time. Maybe, you know, some pattern of mistakes, which people appear to be doing, would in fact let you be better off than the mechanism where you made it easy for them to see what's going on. Um, it does not account for all kinds of important dimensions of complexity. Uh, one prominent dimension is framing, right? The, uh, the theory I stated to you depends only on the extensive game tree. It doesn't depend on you know, how we label the moves. It doesn't care whether you're playing an auction in English or French or ancient Greek. Uh, undoubtedly, playing an auction in ancient Greek affects the rate of dominant strategy play. Uh, it abstracts from the, the difficulty of searching a deep game tree. So it assumes that you can keep track of the consequences of your strategies even hundreds or thousands of moves in advance. Um, it abstracts from computational complexity, which is real and pressing. It abstracts from communication complexity, which undoubtedly is also a real constraint on mechanisms. Um, it has nothing to say about Bayes-Nash mechanisms, even though almost certainly some Bayes-Nash mechanisms are easier to play than others. We have no language for saying that. Well, I, that's not strictly true. Uh, Tillman Borgers and Jiang Tao Li have a beautiful paper called Strategically Simple Mechanisms, where they try to think about Bayes-Nash mechanisms where you can find your optimal strategy without looking too high up your hierarchy of beliefs. So the thought is if you can find your optimal strategy using only your first order beliefs about your opponent's type, then it's strategically simple. So there's some work on that, but there's certainly a lot of open terrain that's not covered. Um, and lastly, I guess there's a related question rather than talking about whether it's obvious how you should play, there's a question about whether we can explain to you what happened ex post, right? And I think this is potentially more pressing in an age where we're increasingly thinking about using machine learning and mechanism design together. Right? It seems like one pressing question, in addition to saying to someone, look, your strategy is approximately optimal, trust us, the black box will do what it does, is being able to have some way of telling people after the fact uh, what happened and why. And these are all sort of, these are all pressing future directions. Cool, yeah? I have a question about feedback, but um, I guess the, the difficulty we're having here is that mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, right. Right, so, so this is, in some sense, I'm counting things conservatively. Um, the issue is that if I ask you for a full preference list, some choices that you make don't matter. But if I'm asking you to choose serially, and you're choosing as though you, you, you were using that false preference list, I would never spot those mistakes at all. And so if I counted every mistake in the, uh, in dynamic, in, in the strategy proof static random priority, then I would get a much bigger number. Um, but in some sense, that would be stacking the decks in favor of finding a result. Uh, so here I'm making a conservative count. I'm sort of blinding myself to those kinds of mistakes, even though they are real. Uh, and I think if you were to ask how often does a game, oh, it's been a while since I looked at this data, I, I, I would bet that that increases by a good 15 to 20% if you ask how often do we have a game where at least one player plays a dominated strategy. So, so this is just when the outcomes are Just when the outcomes are different. Yeah, yeah. So, so just... So just when the outcomes are different, if you were to say, what if ev everybody reported the truth? Well, this first number would go up, but this second number would stay the same, but that's sort of artificial, right? That second number is because I'm not eliciting a full list. I'm asking you just what would you like to do? Which, which prize would you like? Cool? All right. Um, so. I think, yeah? Ah, yes. Um, 
Da, 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 da. So I think the answer for this is on average, condition on submitting a wrong preference list, you're losing about $2 um, in, in this high stakes version. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, submitting a wrong preference list doesn't always harm you, but condition on doing it, it harms you um, in expectation. Okay, um, so I guess one thing to say, especially if you're a grad student, uh, especially if you're a grad student not in an economics department where you might look next, uh, there are these beautiful handbook chapters, the Handbook of Behavioral Economics, Volumes 1 and 2, uh, that's beautifully curated, especially if you want to, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff I haven't talked about today, obviously in the interest of time, that would be a natural place to look. Uh, your local economics department hope, hopefully has a graduate level course you might want to think about doing. Uh, there's this thing, I think most econ PhD students know this, but perhaps this is not entirely known in the AGT community. Uh, there's this Russell Sage behavioral summer camp, uh, which is just a standard thing. If you're a PhD student interested in behavioral economics, you send in an application, they take you know uh, 30 people and you go into like the wilderness in, I forget, in somewhere in the Northeast, uh, and they, you know, you, you, you get the good and the great to tell you about behavioral economics for a week, and in between you go like mountain biking. It's fun, you should think about doing it. Uh, but more than that, uh, you could try writing a paper. Uh, I often don't understand things until I've tried to write a paper about them. Sometimes you don't understand them afterwards, but that's my own problem. Uh, or you could come chat over lunch. Uh, but beyond that, I see no reason to take up any more time than necessary. Uh, happy to take questions offline or in closing. Cheers. Thank you so much. <laughs>